Hello, welcome along, welcome back. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly, the podcast that searches out all the secrets deep down lurking around the universe. My name's Dan Simpson. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening and downloading us. Uh, This week, we'll learn about an animal who seems harmless, looks pretty strange, a little bit cute, but actually, it can be extremely deadly. Also, I've got some space news for you, and I'll answer your questions. As always, this week, they're about something very poisonous, about what happened before everything actually happened, and flies and time. That's coming up first. Let's jump into it. Let's get a lesson from the smartest school outside of the solar system. This is Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Space for all. All right, settle down, everyone. As you know, this term we're looking into the future. Brilliant, time travelling again. Not that sort of future, Sam. (laughs) We're looking at all the sorts of space jobs you could do when you're older. And that whatever your interests are, there's a career in space for you. But I just don't think I'm cut out to be a rocket scientist. I can't even do a Rubik's Cube. I've no clue what I want to do when I'm older. Not so fast. Space is for everyone, not just the rocket scientists. For example, Zlot, what's your favourite subject? Um. well, we had a cool geography school trip to the free-floating planets in Orion. That was fun. They are these cool little planets that don't have a sun to orbit. They just drift through space on their own. So, Zlot, why was it fun? Well, it was interesting to travel to a new place. Looking at maps on the way to plan our route and then swooping through the colourful gas and plasma clouds of the Horsehead Nebula, it was like flying through a rainbow. And then seeing the planets with our own eyes. So cute. And... They're all different. When we got back, we drew maps of where we had been, and of the planets too. But could that be like an actual job? Doing geography about space? Geography is all about studying the physical features of a planet, the surfaces, whether mountains or valleys, seas or forests, and working out why there are differences. Those differences might be due to what they're made of, or the weather, or magnetic activity like volcanoes. No two planets are alike. Now, on Earth, people who study geography are called geographers. In space, we talk about planetary scientists. And with ten septillion planets in the observable universe, that's a lot of surfaces to study. What's a septillion? A blooming big number. Come on, computer simulation. Exoplanet 55 Cancri E. Twice as big as Earth, but eight times as heavy. That was a puzzle until planetary scientists figured out that it's largely made of diamonds and a bit of graphite. Quite a different landscape, eh? OK, what about this one? Computer sim GJ1214B. It's boiling here, and this mist, I can't see a thing. This has been described as like no planet we know of. It's mostly composed of water with a thick, steamy atmosphere. And if you want to get hotter, Sam, computer sim WASP-12B. There's fire everywhere. Not sure I like it. This is the hottest exoplanet that's ever been discovered. It's a toasty 2,250 degrees Celsius. It's so hot because it's only 2 million miles from its sun. OK, back to class. So, as you can see, surface landscapes can be hugely different from planet to planet for a host of reasons. And planetary scientists study them carefully to find the reasons why. So, no rocket science needed. (laughs) Like I've said, space isn't just for rocket scientists and astrophysicists, even though they are important. If we want to visit new planets, we need experts who have the skills to study them and give us information about what they're made from and how they were formed. People who study a planet's gravity and magnetic fields and the geological processes that have changed it over millions, even billions of years. Geographers and geologists, planetary scientists. Maybe you'll be one of them's lot. I could make maps so people don't get lost or could find the best places to put buildings or land spacecraft. 
Exactly. I wish I had a favorite subject. I mean, geography is okay, but don't give up yet, Sam. There's as many jobs in space as there are stars in the sky. <coughs> Quark, did you have to? Although I think one quark is quite enough. Deep space high, space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. Question time then. Love this part. It's where you send your science questions over to me as a review on Apple Podcasts. If there is anything you want to find out, anything sciencey rattling around your brain, that's what you need to do. Uh, Ava has done that. She is in Ilkley. She says, what's the most toxic substance known to man? Well, Ava, it's up for debate. And I don't really want to be the person that has to be the guinea pig and research dangerous, poisonous things. But scientists seem to agree it's called something called botulinum toxin. That's the most poisonous substance that we know about. It's made by bacteria that you can get in some badly made foods. Just one nanogram of this stuff can end a person's life. And a nanogram... Sounds pretty tiny, right? A very small amount of this can be incredibly dangerous. It causes a disease called botulism that you might have heard about. What's interesting is that actually a tiny amount of this is used in cosmetic surgery, uh, which is where people make changes to how they look. It can make something called Botox, which stops you looking like you have wrinkly skin. But too much of that in the wrong way, too much is even a tiny amount... It can be very deadly. It's the most poisonous substance known to man. Here's a question from Luke in Australia. I'm going to do my best here, Luke, but I am just one person with a podcast. This takes a whole field of the smartest people around to try and figure out. Uh, Luke asks, if there was nothing before the Big Bang, how did the Big Bang happen? Surely for something to happen, something had to be there. You see what I mean? The biggest question anyone's ever asked. Why are we here? How did it happen? I mean, if I answered that properly, Luke, if I could figure that out, I would be a trillionaire more. I'd be the smartest genius ever. Loads of scientists are trying to figure it out. How can something come from nothing? Now, they're trying to figure out, you might have heard of particle accelerators. These fire particles, tiny bits of matter around a big ring. At huge speeds, they get faster and faster and faster. Finally, they smash into each other. Scientists think that that explains when these particles hit each other, that something is made there, which makes matter out of nothing, if you understand that. I mean, it's really complex to get your head around. The truth is, we don't really know, Luke. We don't know how something can be created from nothing. But you need to be sure some of the smartest people in the world are trying their hardest to find out. And when they find out, you can absolutely bet that I'm going to tell you, Luke. Thank you for the question. Uh, Lastly, this is from Vegan Dino, who says, Why is a fly's perception of time slower than ours? Did you know this? The smaller an animal is, the slower time goes for it. For flies, it's like they're seeing things in slow motion. It's all because of how their eyes see light. They see light flickering four times faster than we do. Now, because they see so much light moving so much quicker, uh, they see more little things that happen, and that makes time seem slower to them. It's kind of mind-bending, this. But that's why uh, a fly sees time slower than we do, because they're actually seeing more of everything. Thank you for the question, Vegan Dino. If you've got something that you want answered on the show next week, leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. This week on the Fun Kids Science Weekly, we're talking about how computers are getting very smart. A little bit too smart. Uh, They might be able to pick up something that I think we all struggle with sometimes. Uh, Computer science researchers at the University of Central Florida have developed a sarcasm detector. Uh, To tell us more about it, Ramya Akula from the University of Central Florida. She's with us now in Orlando, the place with all the roller coasters. Uh, Ramya, thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Now, very quickly, before we start, it it would be quite good to try and define sarcasm (laughs) because it's quite a hard thing to um to to kind of figure out i guess when you were trying to 
make these computers, to make artificial intelligence learn about sarcasm, what did you tell it that sarcasm was? You already explained it. So it's really hard even for humans to detect sarcasm. It's a kind of a figurative language, right? So we, and even humans even struggle to detect sarcasm. So in our case, um, we tried teaching the computer or teaching the algorithm to know the differences in the, um, in the connotations of uh, how people talk and what are the like different interpretations of it. Um, so for any machine learning algorithm, we need the data. We use the existing sarcasm detection data sets um, and the data is already labeled, which means um, given a sentence, it has a tag whether uh, that statement is sarcastic or not. Um, so we use these samples both the positive samples and the negative samples in the data and train our uh, neural network. In this case, uh, we have a self-attention-based multi-head architecture. Uh, we train this architecture and then we have the special feature called the attention. What attention does is that it looks at in individual words in, a sta in the sentence and then it tries to understand the relationship between uh, one word to the every other word. So these are some of the uh, like the internal mechanisms that gives the cues to detect whether that statement is sarcastic or not. And once it is, once the architecture or once the network is trained, then we test on an unseen data. And then we evaluate the uh, architecture. Because the thing with sarcasm, it throws off a lot of people. My mum and dad don't have a clue. Because when you speak it, sarcasm is, is when you're, you say something which you don't really mean, usually to have a joke, perhaps to be mean. Mm -hmm. It's easier to spot when you say things out loud. One of the big problems today is that people write something online which they think is a, is funny, but other people don't take it like that. You mentioned the cues that this uh, this AI, this algorithm was picking up. What were the cues that it was detecting to figure out what was sarcastic? Most of the times it's the adjectives that make the whole lot of difference in a statement. And uh, as I said, the connotation of these adjectives um, and then the special symbols. Uh, so for uh, right now, we only use the text data. So text data, uh, it has like, for example, we have the data from the Twitter, Reddit, and these kind of discussion forums, uh, where people use different kind of emojis and the special symbols and hash hash and stars if they don't want to like reveal what they actually want to say. Um, yeah, so along with the adjectives, these special symbols are also detected as a cue. Again, it based on the context. So the our algorithm tries to understand the context and based on the context, it will see whether um, given special symbol is appropriate cue for sarcasm or not. Like for example, um, I mean, so this one um, in real world, let's say uh, with a high velocity and volume of social media data um, that you know these companies rely on tools to analyze the data and to provide the customer service, right? So these tools, perform the tasks such as like the content management, sentiment and analysis, and the extraction of relevant messages, um, like for the company's customer service representative to respond to. However, these tools lack the sophistication to decipher more nuanced forms of languages like sarcasm or humor, in which the meaning of the message is not always obvious and it, it's not explicit, right? So. So this actually imposes an extra burden on the social media team, which is already inundated with the customer messages to identify these messages and then respond appropriately. So in situations like that, uh, our algorithm would help them to better understand and help uh, or provide more service to their customers, a better service, actually. When Before you did this, uh, Ramya, before you... Uh, focused your efforts on sarcasm or now that it's over how do you decide 
what you're going to try and teach AI to do next? Like there's so much that yeah. it, it can learn. <laughs> what do you do? Do you have a, a, write some post-it notes up and throw a dart? How do you decide what's next? So one of the problems that we are facing since a quite a long time is the fake news and uh, unhealthy communication like, you know, hate speech or kind of a toxic language or um, in fact, the toxic spam detections. So right now we are working on on detecting the toxic spans um, and not just detecting, detecting is still kind of a, like a old school fashion uh, because I, I say that because um, many machine learning algorithms are labeled as black box models. The reason why they say that is no one knows what the architecture is actually learning unless it throws some output. So that's why it's labeled as a black box model. Um, but in our research, even for the sarcasm thing, uh, we are more focused on the interpretability part, um, not just the detection. So yes, our algorithm detects something, but what it is actually learning in order to produce this output is the interpretability part. And we succeeded it for the sarcasm detection. So right now we are working on uh, detecting the bad speech, that, like as I said, the toxic language. So you know, you're making the world a, a, a better place with all of this, trying to cut out toxic language. Thing is, AI is getting very smart. Now it can detect sarcastic language. How worried are you that it might learn sarcastic language and do sarcastic language back at you when you tell it to do something? <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually, there are, uh, I mean, there is a possibility. Um, but in a real world, I think it would help more, um, most of this content management um, media teams who tries to make their daily shows. Um, but in reality, probably in a day-to-day -day life, I think it would bring more fun, I guess. I mean, it could be like a part of a family member, like Alexa or any Siri that's talking to us sarcastically. I mean, we are a little far away or because all these personal assistants right now, they are pretty shallow. Um, but going forward, I think, yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> Amazing. But it's quite possible. Amazing. Well, Ramya, Ramya Akuda from uh, the University of Central Florida. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the Science Weekly and telling us all about it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. You guys are doing a great work. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're looking at a creature that seems harmless, but can actually be extremely deadly. We're talking about the giant anteater. Now, come on, we know that they're dangerous to ants, clues in the name, but being dangerous to us humans turns out they can be they look quite strange i think they look a little bit cute they're hairy they've got four legs they've got these long snouts that they use to suck up ants uh, they live in central and south america now they can barely see they've got awful hearing they've got no teeth but they do have extremely sharp claws now these claws are meant to dig through ant hills and termite homes but if you get in the way they can do some serious damage. They can slash, they can rip right through a human. They're known to stand up on their back legs and to open their arms up like they want to hug. But you can't fall for it. It means they're about to leap forward and tear you to pieces with their four sharp, deadly claws. We're travelling back through time now. Take a deep breath. Be as brave as you can be. We're headed to the age of the dinosaurs. <laughs> Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Welcome to the Jurassic period, which existed between 145 and 200 million years ago. With the supercontinent Pangaea continuing to separate, more and more big watery lagoons were forming and along with the new oceans were teeming with life, from the tiny to the monstrous. Wow, so many animals, but where are the dinosaurs? Dinosaurs didn't live in the sea, but all of the first creatures to appear on Earth did. On the seabed, you would see sponges that looked like squishy lumps, tiny corals that were building huge rocky reefs and starfish. These animals had been around for millions of years before dinosaurs and are just like those you'd find on the beach today. Hey, 
Look at that huge shellfish with wavy tentacles. Cool. That's an ammonite. It's a close relative of squid and octopuses, whose ancestors had already been around for 150 million years before the first dinosaurs appeared. They came in all sizes. Some were as big as two meters wide. The hard shell protected its squishy body, and its tentacles were used for swimming and catching food. Quick, get out of the way! Something big's coming! Make way for a plesiosaur, one of the Jurassic period's biggest beasts. Plesiosaurs were sea creatures with tubby bodies, four flippers, and a short tail. Some had long slender necks and small heads, while others had huge heads but short, powerful necks. They were both agile and terrifying. Some of the biggest, like Liaplorodon, were at least 10 meters long. That's nearly as long as a bus. They had sharp teeth that could be over 30 centimeters long. They were the top predators in the ocean, feeding on whatever marine reptiles and fish they could grab. Let's get out of here. Away from the oceans in the watery lagoons lived even more sea monsters. Fast fish eaters like the ichthyosaurs were dolphin-like creatures with a tail fin and four flippers. Temnodontosaurus was a massive ichthyosaur, over 10 meters long, with huge eyes that helped him see in the gloomy water. Since ichthyosaurs didn't have gills, they couldn't breathe underwater and had to come to the surface to breathe, just like whales do today. Paleontology, pick. Fossilized skeletons don't just tell paleontologists what creatures look like, they can tell us a lot more. For example, from fossils of pregnant ichthyosaurs, we know that they gave birth to live young in the sea. No fossils of pregnant plesiosaurs have ever been found, but we know their ancestors laid eggs, so they probably came out on land to make nests, a bit like turtles. <laughs> Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Things are happening, by the way. People are busy. Plans are going ahead uh, for our very first Fun Kids Science Weekly live show. It's happening at the end of August, the 27th, at the Underbelly Festival in London. So if you love this podcast, if you want to come, if you want to see it be made, if you want to be in an episode, see some experiments, ask questions to some of the biggest geniuses around, maybe see some live deadly dangerous stuff as well you need to get your tickets to fun kids science weekly live happening in london the end of august the 27th perfect way to finish your summer uh you can get your tickets right now over at funkidslive.com it's time for this week's science in the news billionaire businessman sir richard branson flew to the edge of space in his Virgin Galactic rocket plane a few days ago. He's been building it for 17 years. Uh, he was up in the air for an hour. The rocket plane called Unity flew 53 miles into the air and soon he won't be alone. Uh, he's going to take people, paying people, people like you and me, he's going to go up into space with them as well. That's happening a little later on. Uh, also, a bit of rock that fell to Earth in a blazing fireball back in February over the UK, it's now officially a meteorite. It's called the Winchcombe meteorite because of where it fell in England. Experts think that the bit of rock comes from the very beginning of the solar system, which means it's about 4.6 billion years old. And finally, a rocket company called Skyrora is looking for ideas to get one of its satellites back. The Prospero satellite has been in space for 50 years. It was launched in 1971. It's not used anymore, but it's still circling the globe more than 1,000 kilometers in the air. And they want to bring it back to put it in a museum. So they're looking for ideas on how to get up there and grab the satellite. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Remember to get your tickets to come and see us live to help us make a podcast. It's in London at the end of August. You can get your tickets at funkidslive.com. While you're on the website, one of the best places that you can hear loads of brilliant podcasts that we make. You can hear us wherever you get your shows normally. Make sure you follow us on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. 
you can listen to us all over the country on your DAB Digital Radio, on that free Fun Kids app, and at funkidslive.com. <laughs>